Well, Fiscal Mayor Huladunius Falcha, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. This is the eighth uh, meeting of 2018 of the Justice Subcommittee on Policing. We have no apologies. Uh, Daniel's going to have to leave, leave us a bit early. He has a, a, a pressing engagement. Uh, agenda item one is a decision on taking business in private, which is a discussion on the subcommittee's uh, work programme. Are we all agreed? Agreed. Thank you very much indeed. The second item on the agenda is an evidence session on Police Scotland's digital data and ICT strategy. And I would refer members to paper one, which is a note by the clerk, and paper two, which is a private paper. And I welcome Kenneth Hogg, Interim Chief Officer uh, at the Police Authority, um, David Page, Deputy Chief Officer, um, Martin Lowe, Acting Director of ICT, James Gray, Financial, just beg your pardon, Chief Financial Officer, uh, and uh, Detective Chief Superintendent Jerry McLean, Head of Organised Crime and Counter-Terrorism for Scotland. Um, you're all very <laughs> welcome. And, and I thank you for the written submissions, which, as ever, are, are very helpful. Now, we'll go straight away to questions. And the first question is from Margaret. Yeah. yeah. Uh, good afternoon, gentlemen. I wonder if I could start by asking each of you um, why the transformation of the legacy forces IT platforms is still, to a large extent, outstanding. Anyone like to start with that? Yes, Mr. Page. Thank you, Mr. Mitchell. Um, am I, I think I'm okay there. Um, Mr. Page, I just say you, you don't need to press the button. All oh, right, okay. Engineer will do that for us. Thank All you. All right, thank you. Um, the investment pre um, 2013 in the legacy ICT forces started to drop off, which is usual when organisations emerge. So there wasn't any investment going in. Uh, other than the kind of care and maintenance pre-police reform, when we got into police reform in 2013, um, the, what was required was two things, a, a clear strategic ICT plan for delivery and investment to support that. Obviously, there was a, a, a piece of work under the I6 project and programme, which we've previously uh, discussed at this, uh, at this committee, uh, which was meant to address some of the issues that required uh, to be dealt with uh, in terms of addressing technology issues. Unfortunately, that programme failed, but that programme was also look at only looking at part of the technology investment that was required. There's a separate component to this outside of technology, which is the actual funding that you need. And what we needed to do, and which is where we've now got to, is have a very clear um, vision strategy and set of plans around the technology requirements to integrate 10 organisations into one, which was the original police reform requirements. Uh, and then over and above that, obviously with the publication of the police in 2026 to enable the, digitally trans the, the digital transformation. There was a couple of components we needed there. One was around making sure that we had um, the financial competence and governance and controls in place to understand uh, what was required in terms of investment and that we can control that money and we could plan that money appropriately, but also separately to do the work. Unfortunately, we didn't have enough um, people, capability and capacity within our existing teams to, to do that work. For the most part, um, the guys were, uh, the teams were fully stretched, just keeping the lights on. So it wasn't until at the back end of last year uh, and in early into this year that we're able to use some of the reform funding to get additional resource in to do that detail planning. That detail planning has now been done. Uh, we've also put in place over the last year or so, um, it significantly improved controls around finance which means we now have an ICT strategy that's underpinned by proper financial planning, which links into the, the rest of our change program. So it's been quite a, a tor <laughs> torturous journey, but the last 18 months has seen a significant uh, uplift in our capability, our people, um, our capacity, and the investments that we've actually been directing into doing this work specifically. I think it may be as much of a con concern. It's only 18 months ago you realised you didn't have the in-house capacity. Would anyone else like to, to tackle this one? It's a pretty fundamental question. Yes, Mr. From, from my point of view, uh, convener, um, I, I would agree with some of the points the DCO has made. I mean, I think simply there hasn't been the, the right levels of investment. Um, the technology estate and the footprint is, is, is complex, it's disparate. Um, pulling together that kind of integrated uh, vision around digital data and ICT is actually quite a, it's quite a complex uh, piece of work. <coughs> from, from my point of view, I think the organisation did need to set that framework in terms of um, kind of strategic plan around 2026 and the three-year implementation plan. And as David has said, we're now getting to the point where we're understanding 
the level of investment uh, required to, to address the gap? If, if I may, to, to add to that, um, when I was brought into the organisation, which was about 20 months ago, one of the things that I was asked to do was to evaluate why we'd not made as much progress as we needed to do, um, both on ICT and broader corporate services transformation, but also to look at how we could address the, the multiple Section 22s that we'd had around financial control. So I initiated um, a series of health checks of the finance function, later on the ICT function, others to see what the gap was between where we were and why we weren't doing what we should have been doing and what was needed to close that gap. The first one we looked at was, uh, sorry, the first one we looked at was the finance function, which was where we had obviously a lot of uh, audit Scotland reports on that. A result of that initial analysis, a kind of gap analysis of where, what we needed to do the job properly versus what we had, resulted in a, a, a very significant investment in the ICT function of additional capability to make sure that we could manage the money properly and put proper controls into it. Subsequently, we did the same. I ran a health, uh, an ICT health check in the summer of last year, and that gave me the information to understand what the gap was in terms of capacity and capability that we needed to fill. The, understanding what that looked like then allowed me to bring in professional services to help fill that gap and then develop a strategy now, which has also led to the requirement for future investment uh, that we're looking at at the moment to deliver on the transformation. So that's been the journey over the last 18 months. Health check, understand the gap in finance, plug the gap, and then the same on the technology front. Finance and funding seems to be a key component. Would you like to comment, Mr Gray? What I would say is I agree with the comments that have been made, but fundamentally, I suppose, if you don't have the strategy, you're not going to be in a position to set out what your funding needs are and then put forward the case um, to, to compete against other parts of the public sector for what is a scarce resource of capital funding. So we haven't been in that position, and, and I don't think that's particularly news in that Audit Scotland for a number of years have been highlighting the fact that one of the significant um, gaps that, we, that, that Police Scotland SPA had was a, a lack of an ICT strategy, and it, I wasn't here in the early years, so I couldn't comment in, in any level of detail, but I suppose how it looks to me is that the, the way in which it's been tackled has been on a kind of incremental basis and looking for bits of money to do bits of improvement, but not actually taking the step back, looking at the overall, um, you know, what the overall requirements need to be to, to transform what is, you know, the old eight legacy forces into something that was as an integrated national um, police ICT infrastructure and, and, and capability. And, and now that's the work that's underway. And that's, that's the reason why now we're starting to get a, a, an understanding of the quantum of the investment in required to take us from those legacy arrangements into something that you know is, is required for a, a national police um, service. And from an SPA perspective, Mr Hogg? Thank you, yes. From the, from the SPA perspective, clearly the need to progress work on ICT has been evident since the creation of Police Scotland and this committee has discussed in in the past, the work undertaken on the I6 programme. But I think what's different now is that for the last year, we've had a strategic plan for policing, the Policing 2026 strategy. And the work that's been taken forward now has two main functions. One is to create a fit for purpose ICT system, which moves us on from the eight legacy forces systems. But the second is to actually use that ICT platform as an enabler of wider change across Police Scotland. And the work that's been taken forward now, and the work that's been, I think, shared with yourselves at the, at the stage of a strategic outline business case, is not a standalone ICT project. It's an integrated digital data and ICT project. And it's positioned firmly within the context of that wider 10-year strategic policing plan. Uh -huh. Yeah, that, that, that's good that we're looking forward, but I asked you to identify from the SPA point of view what you think had gone wrong in these four years, for example. Um, was it a case that perhaps I6 projects was um, just swallowed up too much resources, too, too many eggs in one basket? Did SPA come to a conclusion of why we are in this position now? I know what you're doing in the last year or so going forward, but did SPA reach a conclusion? Well, the I6 programme and its ultimate failure was reviewed extensively, including by Audit Scotland. And the lessons from that were, were learned. And one of the questions which the SPA has been asking and has received assurances from Police Scotland now is, have those lessons been learned? 
And I think colleagues here could point to specific examples of where things are being done now differently, having learned the lessons from I6. But to answer your direct question, there was a focus on ICT in, over the last five years. That focus was primarily around I6. That programme did not deliver. And now we're, we're um, seeking to move on from that with a strategy which both, as I say, improves the legacy eight forces infrastructure, but also positions that within a broader strategic context. Yeah, and others will dig down as to why that didn't move forward and the lessons learned. Well, Kathy, to leave it there, can we? Okay, know? thank you, Margaret. Daniel. Thank you. Um, I'd really like to ask you about the sort of the, the fundamental purposes. Uh, having read the, the, the detailed document that was submitted to the SPA board at this last meeting, I think one of perhaps my concerns is that while it's got a lot of detail about the technology uh, uh, that, that needs to be built both in terms of uh, infrastructure versus other elements of I IT, and, and indeed there's a lot of detail there about kind of the plans and strategy, could you perhaps detail what it will deliver or seeks to deliver in terms of police core function and, and uh, practice? Um, thanks for the, for, for the question. Um, so from, from again, from my point of view, um, it's not about technology for technology's sake. It is about harnessing the benefits of uh, uh, technology to deliver support and those operational uh, efficiencies and improvements in policing. So uh, if I may convene, I'll kind of take you through some of the, the core elements mm -hmm. in terms of the operational uh, impact. Hopefully that will answer your question. Um, so the, the strategy is designed to, to allow us to resolve some of the challenges we have around data in terms of reducing our, our, our data silos, improving data quality, um, harnessing data and using and exploiting that data to support better uh, decision making. Um, the data input element, I think, has been uh, widely kind of trailed in terms of uh, officers, uh, you know, having to input the same sets of data into multiple systems. So clearly the strategy um, would, would aim and seek to ad address that to get to a point where there is a kind of single um, single data input, single search as well, actually, in terms of a, a kind of federated uh, search capability. The core operational systems element, which is effectively um, uh, the, the, the part that I6 didn't, didn't deliver, is still absolutely fundamentally uh, uh, key. Um, so delivering that kind of single national integrated uh, uh, solution uh, uh, that caters for uh, crime case inquiries and, and the, the, the basic elements that officers use is, is key. Um, the, the strategy talks about mobility uh, and the need to support uh, much greater uh, uh, officer uh, mobility. Again, to avoid the need for that the kind of scenario where, where officers need to return to base at the end of their shift and then have to uh, do that kind of multiple keying into multiple systems, which in effect does not help with the data quality, because that that of itself is 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 not uh, is not going to uh, get a, a necessarily good outcome in terms of data quality. So mobility is 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 is, is pretty key. Um, analyt analytics and business intelligence. We've not really exploited uh, uh, that area um, significantly, and I think there's a lot of scope to do that. Public contact. So there's quite a bit mentioned in the strategy about what would need to happen in terms of facil facility and greater public contact. So, um, you know, online crime reporting, tracking crime, different mechanisms for, for members of the public to actually uh, contact and deal with the police. Um, a lot of those kind of mechanisms that are, are fairly uh, obviously used in lots of other parts of the public sector uh, today are, are not available at the moment. And I guess the final thing for me, uh, convener, is the kind of partnership working element, um, the kind of core platforms that we need to support um, to support that partnership working. And if I give you a specific example in terms of the criminal justice uh, community and um, kind of digital evidence sharing, you know, we really have to get our own core operational policing systems um, um, fixed before we can actually contribute to that wider um, uh, kind of digital evidence uh, sharing agenda, given that uh, not all, but quite a lot of the, the data and the processes uh, originate in and reside in um, uh, the police as the, as the, as the first organisation. So 
those are the kinds of things that we're, we're trying to uh, address within within the strategy from an operational perspective. Uh, thank, thank you for that answer, and I understand much what you're saying. However, dare, dare I suggest that most police officers probably don't talk about kind of federated data searches. Yeah. They, they're probably talking in, in terms of language about kind of looking up, you know, records um, uh, and searching for it might be vehicle, yeah. uh, like you know, license numbers. I, I, I mean, I think we can all understand that the number of areas where having multiple systems basically creates more time. Have those uh, for, for you know, wasted time for officers? Have those sort of frustrations and inefficiencies been captured? And do you have measures in place to ensure that that any new system is actually improving? against those measures and those frustrations which currently exist? Um, so, so some of that is being looked at at the moment in terms of the, the SOBC and as we move to the, the, the outline business case in terms of the benefit. I think you're right and I agree with you. Uh, you know, Federated search is, is not necessarily a term I would use from, a, from an officer's perspective. It is just about making uh, their job uh, uh, more easy in terms of uh, data input, lookup, search, uh, mobility, Thing, basic things that will, will effectively uh, enable them to do their job more effectively. So, so that is the kind of central tenet of the, of the strategy. So can, can I also ask about the £206 million figure, which is a, a very large figure. I mean, just put that in context, understand that yep. the Scottish Government over the last uh, four years has spent around £400 million on ICT projects. So this would put this at about 5% of, of government spend on ICT. Can I just understand how that figure has been arrived at and how it breaks down. Because as it was pointed out, it's not one you know, shiny metal box that's being purchased. It's, it's multiple systems that are being worked. And I, I, presumably, there is a breakdown of that number. It's just that I, I certainly haven't seen it in any of the documentation so far. OK, well, I can pick up on that um, question. The first thing that I would say is that because this is still a strategic outline business case, the numbers are very um, broad and approximate at the moment. So actually they're in ranges and, and 206 million, the figure that you, that you quoted, is, is at the top of, of that range at the moment. And it's broken down into a number of components which I can, you know, such as infrastructure. And then an the example of that is creating the national network. Um, it's got solution delivery, program management, information and data, commercial and procurement and business change management. And so I can, I can send that data to, um, to committee members if that would be useful. Um, the way in which it was calculated was was a, a combination of a, a bottom-up approach. So working um, when when e. Ernst and Young were in, they were working with um, colleagues within Police Scotland to identify um, what what was in place, what the gaps were, and, and where we needed to get to. But on top of that, there was an overlay of looking at um, other police services that they've worked with previously that have done similar things because. This strategy isn't about doing anything that's 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 particularly new. It's it's just bringing Police Scotland um, in, into line with what, what other police services across the UK have been doing. So it's looking at how much it's costed in, in other comparable forces, which is, is is not necessarily that easy a thing to do when you look at where Police Scotland's placed in comparison to the size of the Met versus the the, the next um, below. But it was taking all of that into account to say, well, based on experiences <coughs> elsewhere and what it is we understand your particular. Um, challenges are, this is what we think the range of costs will be. So at the moment, it's still very high level. And over the next three months, um, the more detailed piece of work is now underway to establish those, firm those figures up. So we, we, we've highlighted the figure of, of 206 million so that there's an, an awareness of it. And, a, and you know, it begins the, a discussion, but actually detailed work now needs to come in behind that to, to put more evidence behind the numbers. Can, can I just finally ask, you know, given the large uh, value that that is, given that things like the NHS 24 recent uh, IT project cost around 100 million and actually raised, rose to about 150, given that the agricultural payments is again around 170 million, this is going to be one of the largest I ICT projects underway within the Scottish Government. Are there any sort of particular considerations you think that need to be given, given its size and indeed expense? Well, I think we need to um, we need to look at what we currently have planned from an IT spend. So we do have a three-year financial plan that, that, and of course, year two and year three are indicative because we don't know what the funding settlement is. But we already have a significant amount of of capital expenditure that, that we had scheduled. Now, whether we would be able to do that um, is, is is something that would would come out of the spending review, but. 
To pick up on, if you look at the first, um, the first five years of Police Scotland, there has been about £90 million spent on ICT. Um, and over the next, um, this year and, and, and the following two years, we've got £94 million scheduled to spend on, on ICT. A lot of that £94 million would be a part of the overall 206 because the things that we're looking to invest in will, will, will feed into the overarching digital data and ICT strategy. So to, to answer your question, I think what we need to do is, is, is marry up what we currently have in our indicative three-year capital plan into what's coming forward from digital data and ICT because a, a lot of that is the same money, because it's, it's the same things that we'll be doing. And then also it would be about the, 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 the timing and the phasing of delivery because obviously we're putting something forward that's, that's five years, but that could be flexed, it could be shorter, it could be longer, and, and that would have a determination as to how much capital was required um, to be spent in any given year. And then, um, obviously, discussions around what well, we already have, or, or we have always had a capital budget, and it's how much of the kind of existing resource or what, what's scheduled do we apply to capital at the expense of not investing in other things like fleets or, or um, estates. In a, you know, in an, a broader conversation around additional funding. So it, this is not us coming here saying we're looking for two hundred and six million pounds on top of you know the, the funding that we were already thinking that we would potentially be receiving for capital. It's about trying to to build that in and and, and work um, w with government to to establish what's a, an, what's an affordable outcome. I suppose so. I hope that answers your question. But if not, I'm happy to expand. Then we've got time. Okay. Uh, hand back. Thank you, Mr. Gay. Before I bring Liam in, Mr. Lowe, can I just clarify something? Because you talked about criminal justice partners, and are you able to outline the extent to which you've had engagement with with these partners, and indeed other emergency services, the NHS? About, you know, I'm thinking about compatibility issues as we go forward. Has, has there been discussion around that? Yes, can, can be. <coughs> a, there, there has. I mean, I sit on the um, program direction group um, along with ACC Malcolm Graham. Um, which is the Scottish Government-led um, digital evidence sharing uh, group, along with uh, my counterparts within COPFS and the court system. Um, so we're, we're collectively in that in that space, uh, discussing and c considering the options for uh, that wider kind of criminal justice uh, digital evidence um, uh, kind of technology solution. Uh, as I said earlier. Uh, my opinion is that we very much need to get almost um, our kind of our own house in order in order to support that work. So um, you know, I think there's good good connections and good dialogue with uh, uh, CJ partners. Um, there's there's work to be done in terms of uh, the next three months worth of work uh, around engaging with colleagues in NHS and uh, local authorities. But we recognise that that absolutely uh, is is a piece of work that needs to be done. OK, that's reassuring. Thank you. Um, Liam. <coughs> Following up um, Daniel's and, and, and the Cavaniers line of questioning there, I, I think Daniel cited the NHS 24 and, and farm payments examples of IT, ICT projects, which I think um, uh, underscores the extent to which many of these projects, starting off with the best <laughs> intentions, that the figures being produced were as robust as they, they could be, but nevertheless have cl climbed and, and climbed quite substantially. I mean, what, I mean, what assurances can you give the committee at this stage that the 206 million figure that you've arrived at, albeit that it's not all new money, encompasses stuff that you'd already be um, committed to doing? Uh, how, how confident you are that, that that figure is not going to climb and climb substantially um, in line with what we've seen perhaps in other in other areas? The first thing that I would say is. Um, I I will have a higher level of confidence when we get to outline business case stage, because at the moment at strategic outline business case, it is very much a, a combination of looking at experiences elsewhere and, and what we think, having done an initial piece of work, that, that, that the need is internally. Obviously, there's a detailed piece of work over the next three months where that will come out with a figure that's, that's more robust and that there'll be much more behind it to support it. But with regard to the 206 million, what I would say is that each of the components that make up the 206 million were individually risk assessed based on how much certainty there was over cost and, um, and scope, because obviously when, when you get into the detail, the scope obviously can change of things. And where, based on that risk assessment, um, there was um, optimism bias applied. So the range was from where there was 
no risk and it was a certainty on something where you know the cost, there was no optimism bias there, but ranging right the way up to 200% um, on things where it, that there was a, a lot of uncertainty. So I think the approach that's been taken from a, from a costing at this stage is robust in that when you look across the piece over the, the whole £206 million, there's about a 50% averaged out optimism bias in, in the business case, in the strategic outline business case. Um, but that does, like I say, range from, from nothing to 200%. But as we move through the next detailed um, phase of work to get to the outline business case, we'll have a greater degree of, of certainty over, over cost. Okay. We've had a, a look forward. Can I maybe just um, uh, encourage a bit of a look back um, for a second? Uh, we've, we've talked about the the extent to which the I6 project was was critical in delivering a lot of um, Blue Scotland's ob objectives across a, a, a wide range of areas, a point picked up by um, auditors, of course. Uh, I, I think in the report um, taken to SPA um, uh, at the end of last month, uh, Mr Page, you talked uh, about the failure of that project and the technology transformation of the Legacy Forces ICT platforms um, not having kind of made um, pr progress and that um, this is, I'm quoting here, uh, continues to present multiple problems and challenges to the service in terms of weakening our operational effectiveness, data and information management and efficiency in delivering the policing services our communities deserve. Could you maybe um, outline in a bit more detail the kind of practical implications of that and um, and also I suppose where police officers and, and staff have been able to put in place uh, sort of workarounds to, to the things they've not been able to do because of um, the failure of I6. Uh, happy to expand on that, uh, Mr McArthur. The, um, there's, there's sort of two dimensions to this. One is the, the police officer uh, doing the job. Um, the fact that we've not been able to roll out mobility, the fact that we don't have a single network yet across the entire country means that um, they they take much more time doing things that they, uh, if we had those systems in place, they wouldn't need to. They have to go back to um, their police stations more often. They have to re-key data more often. They can't exchange data. It just builds in delay, effectively. So there's a big issue around th that. The other issue is about use of data. Um, if you look at if we had integrated systems, um, if our data and analytics were where they were, that we'd be able to give them much better information much quicker to allow them to do their job and be much more effective. If they're responding to calls for vulnerable people and we had better information flowing through, and this is not just our systems, this is how we integrate with the National Health Service, you could actually give them better information right up front, which would allow them to deal with whatever the situation was in front of them um, in a much more effective way, uh, or even actually pull in other partners at a much earlier uh, position. Um, I think we've commented before on the fact that um, we, we do tend to be that kind of service of last resort. Um, if we had better information, we would probably be able to get to the solution much quicker. If you're looking at um, threat, I mean, one of the things that I did comment on previously was the quantum of investment that we know that um, serious organised crime and terrorist are making, and, and that shouldn't be underestimated. The, these, these individuals, these groups, are very, very sophisticated in terms of the way they use it, the technology, and that has, that has a couple of effects, and, and I'll defer to uh, Chief Superintendent McLean on this in a second, but what it does mean is that um, it means our people, our officers trying to combat that don't have the technology they need to to keep up with them. It creates a risk for them, obviously, because <coughs> the, 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 these guys have got more information, and it means there's more opportunity for them to get away with it, but it is quite a key area for us. I'd like to just, mm. if, if I may, hand over to... Uh, Jerry. Yeah, um, thank you, convener and attendees. Um, so <clears throat> I'm principally here as a business lead for organised crime counter-terrorism and they're in cyber and perhaps take some questions later on. You know, just on this point, I don't have any portfolio responsibility for ICT or that wider strategy, but as a business lead, the user experience is just exactly as described. Um, some of the recent successes in the organised crime space that you may have seen in the media, some of the recovery of firearms, those types of groups are ever more sophisticated and challenging to uh, law enforcement, but more particularly to my, my area of business, which is very specialised in terms of covert delivery. So as commercial technology becomes more available, more sophisticated, then as within law enforcement across the UK, and Police Scotland is particularly well placed um, in, in terms of UK law enforcement, but it becomes extremely challenging for ourselves. Uh, and I go back to the point that, that Mr Gray made earlier on, um, 
the, you know, the, the experience internally within the organisation has been that incremental approach to see whether or not there's been opportunities within the capital arrangements over the last few years to try and um, build some of that capability, and, and that's maybe some of the things we'll talk about in cyber later. Um, but I think <clears throat> user experience internally within the organisation is that those governance procedures are, are maturing, they are far better in the last 18 months or so, and that's how we're able to put a more um, informed programme of delivery in place in terms of cyber, in terms of our technical support, and try to meet some of those challenges that we see in the organised crime space and the counter-terrorism space, but they are very real, and we continually, day by day, slip behind the capability of some of those groups out there. Maybe just take you back, Mr Page, to the, the, the point you were talking about, the inputting of data and, and the, the mobility. Have you been able to sort of unpack and distinguish between issues that arise out of a reduction in um, uh, civilian staff within Police Scotland, uh, where officers, it was been suggested, were, were um, stepping in to perform some of those roles, and the roles that arise as a result of the lack of the mobility of data and, and, and all the rest of it? Um, we've acknowledged uh, previously at this committee that there was a, a historic approach um, in response to the redundancies of uh, staff that where we'd not actually made the transformation, um, which was down to the technology. You know, you, if, if you're going to make um, staff redundant or give them the opportunity for redundancy and the work still needs to be done, you need to improve the work. And ideally, you would put technology into that space. Um, what, we, what we found ourselves in a position of was making staff redundant, not putting the technology in, not making that transformation there. The, the work still needed to be done and actually moving officers into backfill. I think the intention was to do it on a temporary basis, but obviously they were there for much longer because we didn't deliver on the technology. The, the effect of that, of course, is it brings officers out of operational policing into effectively what could be described as back office role. So that has an effect. In terms of um, the kind of things like rekeying, it just means that it takes um, two, three, four times as much uh, as it should do to kind of enter a data. They, they, they get the information, it enters into one data, then somebody else has to key it into another data, then they photocopy it and it goes into another. It just wastes a huge amount of time. So it, it's, a, it's all of those issues added together makes us really, really uh, inefficient. And we've got, to, we've got to reverse, and we are reversing. Uh, we've got a, a clear strategy and a clear plan to move police officers out of back office support roles. That was something we've laid out, and we're strategically looking at our workforce balance. What we should be doing is having the right people with the right skills doing the right jobs, and where police officers have got warrant cards or specialist, specialist skills that we need, they should be only in those places where we need them because of they're, they're our, kind of our operational asset for the most part, and they should be in operational roles. The technology is an enabler. It enables them to be more efficient in their operational roles and enables staff to be more efficient in delivery of support. And obviously going forwards from a workforce mix perspective, there are opportunities for civilian staff to su support operational policing in operational roles as well. But for the most part, we've got to get the technology right to enable that underneath it. At the moment, we're dealing with all of that legacy manual processes, people not being in the right places to do the right jobs. And part of 2026 is a workforce strategy, um, this all has to be integrated with the right financial planning, with the right technology enablement. And obviously where we want to get to is operational police officers being deployed with better capacity to do the jobs out on the front line, with our staff in the back office focusing on the jobs that they need to do, but with the right technology. That way we can be more efficient and allow police officers better time. We can save money and, and operate within our budgets and ideally get the, the types of investment through to the specialist technology that Jerry and his colleagues need to ensure we can keep up and ahead of, ideally, um, the opposition, if you like, in this mm. space. Just very briefly, uh, just picking up the point C.S. McLean was making in terms of the commercial development of, of, of IT and what you've said there, Mr Page, to, uh, to keep a pace or even keep ahead of it. I mean, I'm taking it that, that the sort of IT structures that you're looking for, particularly integrated with criminal justice uh, partners, is so bespoke that what you're not trying to build in is an expectation that the costs of this technology are likely to, to come down or come down markedly over over the coming years? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll pick up on that. I mean, the, the approach that we are taking is is a, an enterprise approach uh, as far as possible. So we're certainly not looking to custom build uh, everything, um, if, that, if, that, if that's kind of what you mean by, by bespoke. So we're, 
where we can. We will use uh, off-the-shelf products, enterprise scale products, products that will be able to be deployed across the entire organisation. Of course, there are always going to be operational areas where you need a very, a very kind of custom or niche or bespoke type of solution. But in, in general, the principle is that it's going to be enterprise scalable kind of technology. I think, sorry, just to be very clear, we're not trying to bespoke or gold plate the investments here. If, if you look at our starting point, which is 10 different organisations doing things in different ways, often with different uh, technologies, just by moving us to single platform, sim single technology, which is proven across the UK and in law, law enforcement elsewhere, if we can just get people to move to those almost like vanilla solutions, we can jump forwards quite considerably our capability. So we are looking to do the best, cheapest investment to get us to the right space early. So this isn't about um, people sitting in a room kind of developing super-duper technology. We, we absolutely not going there. This is about core, basic take technology for the entire service to let people do their jobs really, really efficiently. Um, that works from a financial perspective, but it also allows us to have the investment, because we're creating capacity by doing that, to support the types of investment we need in cyber, where it is becoming more specialist. But again, we can work with colleagues across the UK to get those types of investment. Thank you. A quick question from Margaret Nate Stewart. Yeah. <coughs> it was just to pursue this whole line of questioning that Liam Kerr had um, started, sorry, Liam MacArthur had started, and that was from your report, Mr Page, to the SPA board, where you, you say that um, the pressure on offers, officers operating inefficient processes with out-of-date or no technology, while at the same time facing threat, harm and risk from criminals who are investing heavily in the most sophisticated technology and using that well leaves not only these frontline officers and other officers at risk, but the public as well. How worried should we be about this and how immediate do we have to be in addressing this situation? I think it's um, it's very clear. Uh, if you look at um, recent events like the, the, the TSB challenges, um, where there was a, uh, a technology failure within a bank, and in very short order, criminals were exploiting that, developing what they needed to do to exploit that, and were stripping you know significant amount of money off people, and with the bank not having the ability to defend itself at that point. I mean, that's just a very recent example of it. Um, again, Jerry can kind of talk about some of the the, the, the other um, vectors of attack, if you like, that criminals and organised crime. Um, as we become more digital, and I mean, every single day that goes past, you know, every kid that comes out of school, you know, they are driving that digital way of life. As that as that grows and grows and grows, the threat will ex just extrapolate even further because of the opportunity, the size of the opportunity, as everyone gets more involved in digital, gets greater, which creates a much bigger opportunity for criminals. And as Joey said, a lot of the criminals can buy off-the-shelf technology now that is, if you kind of go globally, there's kind of military-grade technology out there that these people can buy. So the opportunity becomes bigger and the risk to the public becomes bigger. The organised criminals have got access to technology that's cutting edge. And what we've got to try and do is keep pace with that. Because if we don't, then the consequences are going to be self-evident. Mr. McLean. Yeah, I would agree and echo that. Um, and I think I've I've gone on record before by saying that as a some of our more intrusive and covert tactics, um, it's almost like targeting another covert organisation who has better equipment and capability than ourselves. Um, and we're very much alive to that. So hopefully, some of the successes have shown that we are adjusting our, our tactical model, our operational deployment model. But yeah, we do have to think about the officer safety because when we're putting them out there with old and dated mm -hmm. kit, that's very visible to, to people out there who pose some threat to us as police officers, particularly <coughs> when we're in that covert environment and not necessarily identifiable, then we've had to debrief, adjust our tactics accordingly, think about when we should be deploying the physical element of it, in other words, officers towards these types of groups, and what other means we can use uh, to work around about that. But again, with the technical technological challenges, that is extremely difficult. So to be addressed right here and now. Basically. Well, it's, it's part of the programmes of work that were put forward through those governance groups that I talked about. So um, I know there's a lot of um, focus on the cyber capability programme, but we have some other programmes of work that are going through Change Board and which SP have some visibility of to try and see if we can close that gap so that we have that, that uh, we can provide that support to our officers who are out there doing um, good jobs in difficult circumstances. Okay. Okay. 
And j just to put on record, I think some of the recent convictions and some high-profile coverage of some of the operational work is to be commended. Uh, so, um, all right. Thank you. Just on that point, in terms of um, capacity, resource, and time skills, in, in order to, as uh, Mr. Page said, get to the point where the uh, your services have the advantage over organised criminals and counter-terrorism, rather than uh, reacting, as you, you state, as, as in, uh, seems to be generally the, the position at the moment. What sort of time, scale, resource, and um, investment is, would be required to, to make that change? Yeah. Um, so I think in terms of some of those high-risk areas, um, we are very much alive to the, the, the part about uh, data privacy and the intrusive tactics that we use. So we understand that and, and again, very alive to that. But nevertheless, the way people live their day-to-day -day lives, we, we all leak and generate uh, digital data around about us. So that provides other opportunities. Um, and, and the reason I say all of that is the way we are deploying some of the, those covert assets against those high-risk threats is very traditional. Um, so it's, it's pretty much the way we've been doing it in police for the last 20 or 30 years, and certainly has been my experience. So there's a real opportunity with the caveat and checks and balances around about data privacy, data security, I think, to lean more towards technology and make a different use of the human element of a police officer in terms of evidence gathering. And that's some of the things that we're trying to lay out through the Technical Surveillance 21, so 21st century, uh, programme of work. Um, it is a poor, probably a more medium to long term, so we're looking at a three-year um, programme of work with various deliveries within that, um, and just very much in depends on what investment av is available to that. But for the frontline officers, they could be starting to realise the, the benefits of that within probably six to 12 months. Um, albeit, what we're trying to do is a, a programme that's, that's incremental, so it's not just working towards an end state. Each stage of it would be an improvement. But the end state would take us uh, probably far in advance of any force, other force within the UK. Just, uh, just to sure. sure. To, to on that point, um, the, the technology platform we need to build for policing, which obviously will support the, the covert work that uh, that Joe's talking about, um, it, it's effectively um, an ecosystem of data and technology, all of which actually underpins the work that uh, is going on in that area. Because um, a lot of what well, you know, local or the territorial policing, police officers on the ground do in terms of their interaction with the public, the data that they can pick up, that stuff feeds through into that journey there, just as importantly as everything else. So one of the things that we've got to do is get the entire infrastructure working efficiently. So those points of data and, and the public are always going to be one of the best access points for us in terms of intelligence. And we've got to have the ability to pick up that information, process that data, feed it through a large organisation and get it to the right people at the right time, which is why in terms of the investment profile and the technology plan, We've got to do the strategic things, which have become the kind of data enablers to get the, the types of cutting edge technology, um, which is where we're going to need for Technology 21 and, and, and the covert area to get to. It has to be built on a, an absolute solid technology platform that captures all that data and feeds it through. So that we, you know, we're going to do it as structured a way as we can, as efficient as we can, but it's the totality of this that makes that work. So in order to create that um, advantage at the, in the specialist level, uh, generic progress is, re is required is effectively what you're saying. Okay, thank you. Thank you, hey. Stuart. Uh, <coughs> thank you, Kavina. Let me just start by saying I hope you don't throw out all the old stuff. Um, there's a bit of computer code I wrote in 1974, which is still being used. And actually, most of you will have seen the output from it and used it. Uh, so the old stuff will work well if you use it in the right way. Don't throw everything out. But I just want to dwell on the lessons uh, from failure. We've had reference to TSB, British Airways are we're grappling with problems. They've been selling tickets at a pound, which they should have been selling at hundreds of pounds. London Ambulance Service in the 1990s, Scottish Qualification Authority in the early 2000s, and now the I6. Um, I used to lecture on project failure, so I particularly ask, are you looking out with your own narrow interests to see if there are lessons to learn from others. For example, the Federal Aviation Authority is a very good matrix for analysing failure. The nuclear industry has the same. The health service has the same. Are you looking outside to see how others have failed, how they've dealt with that failure and how they've learned with that failure to reduce the possibility of 
future failure. Um, uh, uh, absolutely. Um, Audit Scotland produced a very helpful kind of digital lessons uh, on um, public sector uh, IT projects, which had a, a variety of um, challenges and failures. We built that into our thinking. Um, we've already engaged with OGC in terms of gateway reviews. Uh, we've, we've had a strategic uh, gateway zero review done over our entire portfolio at the moment. One of the other things that I did when I mentioned earlier about 18 months ago, 20 months ago, we did a, a, I did a health check around the finance function to look at what we needed to do there. Effectively, we've done that across the, the organisation because if we're going to run a strategic transformation, one of the very early lessons that comes out of Audit Scotland or any of these, anal uh, uh, the analysis around things that have failed or things that have worked, it's about having the right skills and the right capabilities um, in the organisation supported right by the right professionals. So as part of the utilisation of reform funding, which is what we've been doing over the last year or so, we put a substantial amount of skills into the organisation, uh, principally civilian skills around risk management, audit capability. We built a full change function and I've put significant additional resource into the IT function and into the finance function. Part of that is how you do the risk mitigation around avoiding those types of failure, bringing in professional advisors into areas where we, we don't have the long-term skills because you wouldn't need them on a long-term basis. Um, taking cognizance of where others have failed, we're we're building an entire ecosystem around that because we're fully aware of the uh, you know the track record of public sector IT uh, failures and our own I failure in I six. So we're putting, investing a huge amount of effort and money to make sure we give ourselves the best chance of success. Um, this is too important for Scotland. This is too important for the for the public to fail, and it's far too important for our police officers who are out on the ground who you know have to deal with the threat armour risk on a day to day basis. Uh, I'm going to move on to something else, but just before I do, the private sector fails as well. It's just more difficult to find out about their failures. Yeah, um, I agree. And I, I invite you to consider that TSB would be a good example. Um, the other thing I just want very briefly, because I think uh, my colleagues have covered some of this, just whether you have actually got a timeline. Now, we're running out of time here, so it might be that uh, you could write to us with a timeline showing the different activities you're going to be undertaking. Would that be appropriate, Convener, to help us move on? Okay. Very happy to do that. Thank you. Rona. Thank yeah. you, Convener. Um, yeah, in your answer to uh, Liam MacArthur, you talked about the sort of extensive staff reorganisation that was required to, you know, to implement the ICT strategy. Can I ask what engagement you had with unions and staff organisations about priorities and, and uh, the timescale of this? Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll pick up on that. Um, so there's a um, bi-monthly uh, engagement forum with all the staff associations and, and unions. Um, so, so through the first phase of this, in, in terms of taking this to um, SOBC stage, I've, I've presented at the last two uh, meetings of that particular forum the documents and some of the core products that, that were produced as part of that first phase uh, have, have obviously been shared with um, uh, uh, the members and the attendees uh, uh, of that forum. Um, I've uh, asked for feedback and offered, obviously, uh, a discussion uh, with uh, those members, and that's actually in train uh, at the moment. Um, and, and clearly, again, as part of this next stage, as we move uh, into uh, the, the detail testing, I think, as James said, testing some of the assumptions from the SOBC to get to OBC uh, and, and, and really drill into this in a bit more detail, then clearly there's there's a need uh, and an opportunity for that engagement to continue with, uh, with, the, with the staff associations and the trade unions, and we intend to do that over the next three months. Okay, there's, there's more I could ask, but I think we're running a wee bit short of time, so um, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you, Nana. Can I ask about... Um, the I6 contract, which is repeatedly referred to as a failure, but at the end of the day, the money was recouped. Um, the Accenture contract was for 46.1 million. Now, I, I appreciate it might not be a like for like, but it does seem quite a considerable jump to um, the sums that are now being talked about. Is, is, is this greatly enhanced? Is this? Uh, I appreciate I6 wasn't to cover all the aspects of deficiency. With, is, is, it, is it filling the complete gap, Mr. Lope? Yeah, I, I, can, I can see that the DCO is keen to, to intervene, but um, it's exactly that convener that, I mean, the, the I6 uh, programme itself um, 
was very specific in terms of obviously the, the, the six modules were going to be crime, VP, criminal justice, uh, custody, miss, missing persons and productions. Um, so, so all of all of that kind of I six uh, capability almost transfers into what I've talked about in terms of core operational <coughs> systems and the need for that integrated uh, national system. But this piece is, is is much bigger as you've as you've alluded to. It's it's, it's significantly uh, uh, bigger. So the, the two things are not are not the same in terms of scale and hence investment. Yes, getting to the kind of the I six equivalent within the program is still, in my view. Uh, fundamentally uh, uh, key, but there's an awful lot more going to be wrapped around uh, uh, the programme and the transformation than just what was uh, included within the former I6 programme. So just for the avoidance of doubt, there are no, no gaps then, if this is if this is I6 plus, it's it's what needs to be done at this time and, and looking ahead. Yeah, I mean, we don't, we don't believe there are there are gaps. Uh, I mean, the, the, the work that's been done through that first phase, phase has been fairly uh, extensive across all functions and business functions uh, of the organisation. So, uh, I mean, it's almost, it, it's, it's I6 plus and plus again, I would, I would probably um, uh, describe it as. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, ben, you. Okay. Thank you, convener. Um, in the written submission, you go through some of the a lot, provide a lot more helpful information around the, the cyber kiosks. I wondered if you could just clarify the terms and amounts of the cyber kiosk procurement contract for us, please. So, <coughs> my understanding is that the kiosk cost um, approximately £440,000 and we purchased 41 of them. But what I'll commit to do is I, I can provide the committee with um, a, a breakdown of that. Um, and because that was one component of a, of a wider cyber spend last year, which <coughs> was 3.4 million. But I'll, I'll provide details on that. Okay, thank you. What about any suggestion that um, there's, a, there's a trigger point which would involve more involvement for the Scottish Police Authority, and that trigger point's half a million, and that's a, a sum short of half a million? Would you want more kit if you could have? The business requirements that we, we run with are in in uh, response to the business need. Um, the the trigger points as they currently sit are what they are. 500,000 is the spend limit for us within the police. Uh, 500,000 to a million goes to the accountable officer to, to Mr. Hogg. And then over a million pounds, it's the main board. Um, the uh, we, we don't cut the business requirements um, a, a, around those limits. I mean, we have the opportunity um, to, to, and one of the things we do try and do actually is make sure that we have um, modular and right-sized um, approaches to things. So, if, if at all possible, we would try and avoid really big programs because a bit like I six, when they get really, really big, it's easier um, to have a, uh, a fail. What we'd like to try and do is have smaller, smaller size programs where you've got benefits linked to the capital much or the, the expenditure. Um, so we are conscious of that. The other issue we do have is, is pace. Um, there's, in, in order for us to move at pace, um, we have to go through the, the right governance. And one of the things that we, we try and make sure we do is adhere to all the governances that we need to do uh, as we go through that journey. So we, we're very careful to make sure from a finance control and governance perspective that we adhere to the governance procedures that are, are required of us. It's one of the points that uh, Audit Scotland made previously about financial control. You've provided a lot of documents to us, um, Mr. Page, and, and a number of them are redacted. Um, I would have thought it would be possible to say the position of the author of the business case. Who was the author of the business case in respect? The strategic outline business case? No, um, I'm talking about the cyber kiosks in the business oh. case. We'll go for that. So, so that came from the head of the cyber crime unit, convener. Right. Now, if I can provide a bit more detail, so as Mr. Gray said, £445,000, <coughs> excuse me, um, was the figure for the for the kiosks, and in terms of how we came to what we thought the business need or business requirement was, was to try and provide three kiosks to each of the 13 local policing areas. So that was how we came to the figure of 39, and then expecting that perhaps from time to time we may get some hardware failures, it was to try and keep one or two devices within the cyber crime units as resilience to that. So we were working on a figure of about 40 devices at that time. Would we have wanted more? Would it have delivered more benefits? 
we think it probably would, and it's something we'll have to review in the future. But again, that was trying to work it within the financial framework and some of the capital funds that were available at that time. Um, we were alive to the fact that there would be a notification to SPA and possibly signed up by Scottish Government. I think that's reflecting some of the documentation from 2016. But the business requirement from the business area was working on that premise of three devices to each of the 13 local policing areas, um, coming to the, the figure of 39 with some resilience built into that. Uh, and the business case not only didn't determine who the author was, it was undated. What was the date of that business case, please? Or are you able to say? Or? I'm not able to say, but I can perhaps could, could that, yes. That would be helpful, thanks. And as regards approval, at different points in the information you've provided, there's a suggestion that's ACC Johnson um, at page 5 in the documents. At um, page 10, it talks about permission granted by the force executive. Who signed this off within Police Scotland? So if I may, I'm probably best saying some detail of that. So I think what was happening there, and again, evidence has been provided before to the committee, to yourself, convener, around about the trials. In, in about mid-2016, uh, um, there were some trials based on the anecdotal evidence that was coming from forces south of the border who were using that same type of technology. And again, we were looking for that window of opportunity within capital funds that may become available within the business area. Um, <clears throat> to try and get some agreement for those trials, uh, there was a request made to the force executive uh, and others, the chief officers, as whether or not those trials could go ahead. And that's reflecting some of the documentation that you're seeing. Um, the funds were not available in 2016. We revisited that with more trials in 2017, and it was only late in 2017, which was, I think was probably when the business case was written, but I will check the detail of that, that again was put back to the force executive. And ACC Johnson, having the portfolio lead for um, specialist crime and intel, was cited in that, so that's why you're seeing some of those, his name mentioned some of those documents. But ultimately that business case and the programme of work was put through the change board and notification to the Scottish Police Authority. I'll need to let colleagues in, but, but, but before I do, one question there, uh, <coughs> Mr McLean. Um, again, the mention of UK other law enforcement areas. Page four talks about consulting UK <coughs> law enforcement. Can you say who was consulted and what was learnt? In particular, as I, I raised on the last occasion, the experience and the criticism that was voiced for by uh, uh, the oversight body looking at North Yorkshire's application of these devices was extremely critical. Yes. So... Uh, as having the responsibility for cyber, we have representation on the National Cyber uh, Operations Group, so we were aware that a number of the forces south of the border were using that technology and been using it for over 10 years. So when we did the consultation through the Operations Group, we found that all but four of the 43 forces south of the border were using similar type devices from different providers. And we went to six forces, I can provide the details of that, but the Metropolitan was obviously the largest, they were using around about 130 kiosks at that time. Um, from memory, I think we did Northumbria, uh, Lancashire, we went to the Garda in Ireland, and I think there was one other force uh, with, within, um, so we went to Wales, and I think there was one other force within England as well. So we consulted with about half a dozen other forces to see what their experience had been, see what the challenges were about it, to see what their um, operating principles were around about that. Um, our reflections were that that was broadly positive, there had been no significant challenges, there had been some experiences, as you say. Um, there was definitely operational benefits within it, but one of the observations that we made was there was a real absence of consistent ways of working and, in, in effect, a code of, code of uh, ethics, if you like, but a, a sort of operating procedure in terms of how you might take them forward and how you'd operate them within a force. So that code of practice is something that very early stages we were keen to develop and have an ethical response uh, in terms of how we might use them in the future. Okay, thank you very much. That's it. Uh, Mr Hawke, if I could perhaps refer you to your letter of 5th of June um, on the, the financial governance of the SP of these um, cyber college, uh, of these kiosks, then you see as it fell um, below the half a million value, then it didn't need uh, SPA approval. Is, is that your position? Yes, that's correct. For a capital investment over half a million pounds, um, that would need to be submitted to uh, myself as the accountable officer for approval. So that's a capital investment, but the whole contract, we understand, came to 500, 545,000 over that half million um, deadline or um, limit. Wouldn't it it be expected that the SPA would then, under financial governance, look at the contract? 
No, the investment totaled £445,000, and that included within that not only the capital investment for the kit, but it included the, the, the licence um, uh, costs and also costs associated with training. Can I add that... Um, can, I, can I stop you there um, and maybe ask where, where your figures differ from the ones I have in front of me, which suggests that the technology, the licensing, the training and the annual fees amounted to a contract worth £545,000, i.e. over the half million pound th threshold. The figures I'm quoting to you are the figures that I have from Police Scotland. I'm happy to clarify that if you like, but... Um, when I gave evidence to this committee a month ago, I used the same figures on the same basis. Well, we have a discrepancy, and perhaps we can find out. Um, I, I wonder, Mr. Hogg, why? Is, uh, sorry, sorry. If, if, if the issue is perhaps the capital costs alone, but clearly, if there are uh, revenue, the, the combined cost, we, we have a series of figures here. Yes. In addition to the capital costs, there are, there are approximately £100,000 of annual operating costs associated with these once they are rolled out, and that, and that cost is not currently being incurred. The point I wanted to make is that, um, as a council officer, I have looked closely at the issue of cyber kiosks, not least since the committee has raised concerns about them. And I don't have concerns about this. This is not a situation where I have a sense that Police Scotland were trying to avoid scrutiny by the SPA by bringing in a cost below a threshold. The SPA has in any case looked at this over the months and years, over its gestation. This proposal date back to 2015 Cyber Infrastructure Technical Strategy. And I think I've, I provided to the committee a presentation that dates back to September of last year, where Police Scotland briefed members of the SPA on this, among other elements of reform. So genuinely, I don't have concerns that there's a, either a, a lack of scrutiny or some issue about trying to avoid a threshold for referring this to the SPA. I don't have um, concerns about the latter. I most certainly have concerns about the financial governments that the SPA um, undertook when the whole contract, according to our figures, differ from yours, still seem to differ from yours. So perhaps we can get some written evidence, clarify that, and we can return to this at a later date, because um, it seems to me that this is something that is absolutely germane for moving forward and establishing exactly a very robust role from the SPA in its financial governance um, remit. We'll perhaps follow up, Mr. Hogg, with just some clarification around the points, maybe maybe a, a correspondence exchange. You mentioned a briefing. I'm, I'm conscious Stuart's wanting in. Uh, but it is the case that the police authority received no briefing from Police Scotland in advance of the trial? The position is that the police authority did not receive a specific briefing about the trials in advance of their deployment. Yes, that's correct. OK, thank you very much. Stuart. Um, I just wanted to nail down how the governance works. And to reference 30 years ago, in my experience at the, ba the Bank of Scotland, where I could spend a quarter of a million as often as I liked as, in a day, as long as I budget cover. But the key thing was I was a decision maker up to that level, but I was required within 24 hours to tell the next level up I'd done it. And that applied from a teller who had a thousand pounds authority to lend money all the way up and eventually at three million it got to the board. Is there a similar duty in the structure of how this works that there's a decision maker up to one level, but also a process by which the activities of the decision maker are reported uh, to the next level in very short order? Because I think it's those two elements of it that make a robust system of governance. Start that and then hand over to my colleague um, from Police Scotland. The system of financial governance that exists between the SPA and Police Scotland is set out in various um, documentation, including financial regulations, and that specifies the, the arrangements in place for the sort of referrals that you're talking about. Within Police Scotland and under the Chief Financial Officer's overview, they have their own system of um, approvals, which we had also cited on, and at that point I'd, I'd be happy to hand over to the Chief Financial Officer for the detail on that. So um, there were probably two things I would say here, um, and making a distinction between business cases and um, 
the letting of contracts, which is a procurement type activity. We, we have um, an investment governance framework that sets out the governance requirements for business cases that is linked to financial value and also with regard to where the funding comes from, whether it's reform or whether it's core capital, and, and that's all documented. So we follow that so that it applies both to internally to Police Scotland governance and through SPA governance. And there is a requirement in there, for example, for a business justification case that gets signed off needs to be reported I, up. I, I wonder if I can just intervene to try and short circuit this a little yeah. bit. I'm really just seeing um, whether when a decision maker makes a decision, and the procurement process is normally done by clerks, not to be too rude, uh, being a mechanical process. But when the decision makers a decision, is there a formal process by which the decision makers decision is referred up the line in short order so that there is appropriate oversight not to interfere with the decision, to be, be aware and be able to take account of the aggregate uh, effect of all the decision makers decisions? So I understand where you're coming from in terms of the, the, the nature of the question. Our governance is very much driven around a series of boards, um, finance board, change board, audit and risk board, up to the, the force executive board. So any of our business cases, um, which would be also affected... Uh, do, do forgive me, I'm, I'm not trying to be rude, but I'm just conscious of time. I understand there'll be a complex matrix of how decisions are made, but I'm not actually focusing on how decisions are made. I'm focusing on what happens after the decision's made. So the decision's made at a committee. So yeah. the approval for any given business case or, or a yeah. major capital expenditure would be presented to a committee. It would be the, the, either the change board or the, the corporate finance and investment board that would make the decision, not the individual. So it wouldn't be a, a case of an individual making a decision on an expenditure sure. that they could then go and... Um, but who, who, get, who then gets informed that that decision, however it's made, who gets told it's been made? So we would audit uh, and we would have an audit record at each of the individual governance boards of the decision that was made, who was present in the meeting, depending on the size of the decision, it would either be, and that comes into our schemes of delegation on the actual financials, what would happen then is it would either be accelerated up to uh, the force executive or alternatively it would be recommended for approval. For information or for decision? Depends on the, depends on the nature of the, of the decision. So that's two parts. One's capital, well, one's money oh, yeah. level. Sure, the sure. other is about effect to the organisation. It might be that it's a relatively small expenditure, but the actual yeah, public yeah. effect or the effect on the organisation is such that it warrants a discussion at the force executive. And of course, what we do do is also recommend things that go across to the, the relevant committees within the finance committee, so within the SBA, so be it the finance committee or whatever. But everything would be decided in a, in a committee governance structure. There's no unilateral decision making that's then, um, because we, we seek uh, additional support. I'll pass. Yet the Scottish Police Authority weren't notified in this particular instance, Mr Page. On the cyber chaos, cyber chaos. I, I can't comment on that. I wasn't here at that time. Okay. Rona. Thank you, Convener. Um, Mr. Hogg, if I can ask you, please, um, following on from your answer to Margaret Mitchell and the Convener, um, just to clarify, you are comfortable with the approach Police Scotland have taken uh, with regarding the introduction of the cyber kiosks? In terms of the way in which the um, proposed expenditure was handled, I do believe that it was handled in line with the existing processes, both then and, and now. I've, I've since looked at the um, written evidence which Police Scotland submitted to the committee, and just to confirm the figures, um, that the um, total cost of the, the, the purchase of the kiosks plus software plus training package include, came to £444,000, including VAT. In addition to that, there was a £101,000 annual revenue support cost, which would commence, this says, from 2019-20. Will that not take it above the threshold for you to be uh, briefed then? You said it was, it was under the, the whole contract? No, because the way in which the threshold is determined alludes to the capital cost. So, for example, um, most capital costs will, will come with an ongoing revenue cost over, over many years, but the thresholds that are, are, are set in relation to the capital cost 
I'm happy to share, for example, the scheme of delegation which would set that out. Okay. Would you not have expected um, a community impact assessment to have been carried out, given that um, you know there was significant changes to operational policing matters? Is that not something the SPA would have been uh, wanting? Well, having looked at this, the the key point is that this was not a, a change to operational policing in terms of policing capability. This allowed policing to do in local police stations what they were already doing in regional hubs, and it avoided the issues of backlogs arising by sending devices off to doing that. So I, I understand that's the that, rationale but on the community, for, you know, yeah. impacts a community impact assessment to assess what impact it would have on a particular community. Is that not something the SPA would have wanted to have seen done? In this particular case, in respect of the trials, I don't believe it was necessary. In terms of further, further rollout of, the, of the, the kiosks, I know that Police Scotland are setting up a reference group and that the terms of their use is going to be um, consulted on with the external reference group, and I gather that they are now looking at undertaking additional impact assessments. But in terms of the trials that took place previously, I don't believe that an, that an additional community impact assessment was required at that time. Okay. Thank, yeah. you. Thank you. Just building on that. Thank you, Convener. I appreciate that in the written evidence and in the previous session that we had, it was uh, emphasised to us that the use of the kiosks is about uh, efficiency and uh, trying to make sure that devices aren't taken from individuals if, uh, for long periods of time in an unnecessary manner and that the, the cyber kiosk technologies have been available to UK law enforcement uh, for some time. However, as a constituency MSP where I know these uh, part of this trial happened at Gayfield Police Station, so uh, the remit of Gayfield goes into my constituency even though the station is, 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 is partially outside. Um, I do have some concerns that there weren't any assessments undertaken given the uh, intrusive nature of, of, of this technology and that somebody handing over their mobile phone which in the modern day and age has so much information about an individual for there not to be an awareness about it particularly around uh, human rights equalities community uh, impact assessment as my colleagues have said data protection and security i mean if a constituent had come to me at a surgery and said the police have taken my phone and, and looked at every piece of data on it and i even as a constituency msp uh, uh, and, and let alone more widely, wasn't aware of this happening. I, I, I would have some concerns around uh, individuals' um, hu human rights and, and, and right to, 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 to private life. And I just, I, I guess I would say, and I, I'm, I'm reassured that there will be a, a greater uh, determination to, to, to make those assessments for full rollout, but is there any um, sense of regret or, or, or hindsight uh, uh, that you could have perhaps dealt with this more uh, transparently? I'll let my Police, um, police Scotland colleagues uh, comment more on, on their practice, but the key point from the SPA perspective, I think, is that at the time of the trials, phones were already being taken by the police for the same policing purposes. It's just that what happened to those phones differed. So at that point in time, the phones were sent off to three, now five, regional hubs. And what happened in the trials is that the phones, instead of being sent off to those regional hubs, were, inst were instead assessed locally at the, at, at the local police station. So I think that's, that's, that's the rationale um, which, which I've been given mm -hmm. when the SPA has asked questions of Police Scotland about why they did what they did with the trials. And was it, was it ever asked, because I noticed the, the written evidence says that this was only done by suitably trained frontline officers. What sort of training did they go through? How was that, um, were checks and balances in place to make sure that was the case? Yeah, so, so I think what Mr Hogg said there, um, but to answer your question directly and conscious of time, so there was 25 officers at Gayfield Square Police Office were trained on that, so that was the, the provider of the technology trained the cybercrime staff and cybercrime staff in conjunction with that provider trained those 25 officers and there was supervision put in place around about that. And the trials are very much 
not about the public experience, because those phones are already legally taken, as Mr Hogg said, going to a central position. It was very much about the experience of the officers at the front end and trying to build that business case to show there was an opportunity for service improvement and efficiency and try and push that through what was a capital bid at that time. Okay. I still <coughs> feel a bit uncomfortable that my constituents weren't aware of this happening in uh, their vicinity. And uh, I think uh, I would say I'm <clears throat> absolutely alive to those concerns and there's been a lot of lessons learned, which is why I think it is so important that we now do those impact assessments the direction we had at the time was because it was more of a change of use that were not required. You know, I'm able to report that both what would have been a privacy impact assessment and now a, a data protection impact assessment has been completed, as has the quality human rights impact assessment. But I see them very much as, as live documents. Convenient if you're minded, I'll get copies of them to the, to the committee. I think that would be very helpful, Mr McLean. I, I'm conscious that uh, um, Ben asked a, a question about training that's gone unanswered. Perhaps I can answer it from the business case, because I think Police Scotland would, um, in advance of these cyber cases we put in place, would have considered the backroom function of the interrogation of data on phones to be a very specialist function. Would, it, would you be? Would you agree with that? I would agree with that, yeah. yes. Well, <coughs> the, the business, the undated, unsigned business case talks in relation to training, the very last sentence says, it can comfortably taught in well under an hour. That doesn't suggest it's a like-for-like like transfer. This suggests it's a rollout of something different, and that's precisely where the concerns come about. People understand the technical uh, requirements. So I think it would be very helpful to, to have these, these um, assessments. And, uh, so I'd like to, to provide those assessments. I think, if time permitting, if I can come back to that one, convener. Y yes, indeed. Uh, yes. Um, so just in terms of that comment you, that you've, you've made in the business case, that was actually the report that was provided from the officers at Gayfield Square. So that was the supervisor's view of the circumstances. And I think that comment is more uh, attributed to the commercial provider of the equipment. But what actually happened was it was a day's training. Was that enough? Perhaps, perhaps not. Uh, ahead of any rollout of the kiosk, which hopefully will be later this year, um, already the, the Cybercrime Unit staff have attended the three days teaching methods course. Um, they were also working up the training package. And for the 410 officers that are planned to to facilitate uh, that triaging of devices at the front end, so those 410 officers that are in local policing, there will be a two-day training course, but they will only be able to attend that once they've attended the one-day mandatory or, or completed the one-day online mandatory GDPR training, which is going right across the force. So they must conclude the GDPR and then there's a two-day training course. Mr McLean, that, that's something entirely different. That's something entirely different. I'm, I'm reading from the yes. document that Police Scotland have provided to the committee that's headed up business case. Now, as I say, it's uh, um, it, it's redacted, so we don't know who the training was provided by. There's other redactions across across the term, but that final sentence says it can be comfortably taught in well under an hour. That doesn't seem to be replicating a specialist backroom function, and that's where the concerns come from. Well, in answer to that convener, what I would say is I agree with your point about the specialism of interrogation of the data. But in terms of the actual interface with what is a triage device, it's pretty intuitive, it's, it's fairly straightforward, which is the point I think that the commercial provider is trying to make there. So we understood there was checks and balances and safeguards that was required, which was why it was a one-day training. But the actual use of the device in itself is, is, quite, um, is quite straightforward. It's, it's, Mr McLean, sorry to keep coming back to this, not least because there's a couple of very short... Uh, the appendix, the documents we've been sent, Appendix B, Kiosk yeah. Trial Business Case, are you saying that that's been um, a document put together by the provider of the equipment rather than by Police Scotland? No, what I'm saying is I think it's a, it's a view provided by the commercial provider which has been uh, reflected within a police document. Okay, thank you. Uh, ben and then Stuart. Just very, very quickly, not um, questioning the integrity of officers at all, but um, just as a safeguard, are you aware whether the technology is able to delete information from people's devices or is it just able to copy? And if you don't know the answer right now, it'd be good to have clarity on that because obviously the ability to, to delete people's data would be quite concerning if it did have that function. Yeah, so it, it, would, it would do neither. What the, what the technology does is allow a view of the data that's stored on the device and only the data that's stored on the device. And it doesn't materially change that. And that is important because the steps that may follow through the criminal justice system. Thank you. Stuart. Uh, just for clarity, the, 
my understanding, and I want to this rebutted or confirmed, um, is that the kiosk is about triage. In other words, it's about identifying a proportion of the phones that are initially received that can immediately be returned because they're not of evidential value. But that the, remain, the real analysis will continue to be done at the centres. So what it's about is making the centres more efficient and delivering unnecessary phones that are not required back out of the criminal justice system. And therefore, it is only a very small part of what would be done in the centres. Is that correct? So exactly that, Mr Stevenson. Our experience at the moment is that we have up to about 15,000 devices submitted to those cybercrime hubs, as described by Mr Hogg. Um, the anecdotal experience of other forces in the UK, and again, that was purpose of the trials and borne out by the trials, that over 90% of those devices would not be submitted in the future and would actually return to their owners or would be um, negated from the investigation moving forward. So thereby, you know, single digit would go to those most specialists of officers who would then carry out the interrogation and extraction of data. Can I clarify one final thing uh, with you, Mr McLean? And again, it's, it's that I'm lifting this from the documentation that has been provided. Uh, and with regard to the issue of data <coughs> and the phrase evidential efficacy, we're told that that wasn't collated in relation to the trials. Sorry, convener, could you just repeat that, that point? Uh, data uh, collated during the trials, the, uh, and I, the, the, the word I've got in inverted commas here from my notes is evidential efficacy was not collated. What was the Crown Office Procurator Fiscal briefed on following the trials if it wasn't the evidential efficiency of this operation? Um, so the, the Crown Office were, were briefed on the, the trials and they had no objections to the trials going ahead. I think, as I've said earlier on, there's always lessons to be learned and probably there could have been better record keeping around about some of those trials. Um, but some of the, the, the figures are there, but probably what was more reported back was the user experience of the officers at the front end and some of the investigative benefits from that. But as I said previously, I think if we run the trials again, um, I would ensure there was better governance around those trials and some of the, the, the detail that was provided. OK, that's very helpful. Um, that's been a long session. Uh, th thanks very much indeed for your evidence. It's been very helpful. We'll perhaps follow up, Mr Hogg, just a, a letter to clarify that one point and maybe hear from, get these uh, documents from yourself, Mr McLean. Thank you very much indeed. I now move into private session.